Well, I'm so glad that I have the privilege to speak to you today. And uh, I would like to speak actually something that has, uh, has formed my life the, the past seven years when I've been working uh, very much on the streets of Uppsala, of our city, and, uh, and, and, and been meeting a lot of different kinds of people, different groups of people, people that are socially exposed, people that are ex live in explo exploitation and, uh, and have different situations. And, uh, and, and it's a way to sum up how to live the new life that we have in Christ. And the word that I would like to start with today is from 1 Peter 2.17, which is my starting word, and I will build upon that. So please open your Bible or just look at the screen uh, so that you know that this is truly the word of God. And it says like this, uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 17, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. And, and before that, he has been speaking about that we should abstain from the passions of the flesh. We should conduct ourselves honorably among the Gentiles. We should be subject to every human institution. And then he kind of just sums it up in these four different admonitions. He says that we should honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God and honor the emperor. And I would like to speak about these four things, how to live out your life as a believer in Jesus Christ, because it touches so many different kinds of people. Uh, it's not only what happens in your home and in your church. It's what happens when you're everywhere. Uh, and so the first thing that I would like us to look at is what it says here, that we should honor everyone, show honor to everyone. And, and this is a, a hard thing to do because there are people that you would really like to despise. I don't know if you've met those people. They are mean, they are, they are dirty, they smell bad, they behave in a different way, they eat food a different way, they have a different culture. Uh, maybe they are limping, maybe they are jumping, uh, maybe they ride a, a, a BMW or they ride a, a, a bicycle, whatever. We can have so many different preferences, but the Bible still says that we should honor everyone. Why is that? Well, it's because it's because of the creator of every human being that we have on the earth today. Uh, uh, and so every human being deserves a basic respect because of the origin, who is God himself. Uh, so they, they deserve dignity and honor. So we, meet, we should meet all people as human beings with value. And we, place, we can place value on people's life. We can place it on those that are in high positions and we can place it on those that are in low positions. And it's the same principle of honoring uh, people it is a human being. If you take away the label that is on a person's, uh, uh, that is on the desk or that is on, you know, the name tag, I am the professor of this and that. And some people have beautiful, uh, you know, uh, titles and others have no titles whatsoever. It does not matter because we have the same creator that we have come from and we will one day meet the same creator. So take away the labels from people, first of all, when you meet them and meet a human being. James 2 verse 1 to 4 says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you can sit here in a good place. While well, you say to the poor man, you can stand over here or sit down at my feet. I Have you not made then distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This is what James say that we look on the outside, fine clothes, good person, give him a position. And then come a person who has simpler clothes, maybe not 
the very best, maybe not Gant or by, or, or I don't know the brands, I forgot, about, I forgot the brands, but you know the brands, I guess you're into all the fashion and stuff. <laughs> uh, but, and you say, oh, you, you don't have the right style, so you can, you can kind of sit over here on this side. Well, there's something wrong in that picture because, because the Bible says that all people are worthy of showing, of being shown honor. And there can be, even though we don't recognize it, there can be, there can be um, parts of discrimination within us. I tell you, I've been accused of, 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 being, uh, of discriminating. Uh, why? Because one time when I was running a night shelter and there was a drunk man in there who was not behaving and I had to take him out of there because the police that time was very slow to come and help me. And so we had to bring him out. And as he was leaving that room or that building, he was screaming at the top of his lungs. He was screaming, you are a racist. You are a racist. You discriminate me. You are a racist. And it was like this, the spit was just flowing over my face. It felt like it. I don't know how much of it hit, but that was the emotion. And I was thinking, Jesus, am I a racist? Am I, Jesus, am I, show me if I am a racist. Maybe I am a racist, Jesus. Uh, and and I, just, I just look at, the, at Jesus on the cross. He was there. He was accused of many different things. And let Jesus cleanse you. Am I showing this person honor by saying this is the rule and you have uh, uh, trans transgressed it and you need to go out. I'm showing you honor by following the rule of the house. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, there's another very important area of showing honor. And that's when it comes to parents. And we all have parents. You have a mother, you have a father. If you know who it is, or if you do not know who it is, you have it. And it says honor, and this is one of the Ten Commandments. It is the fourth commandment, I believe. Uh, and it says, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you that your days may be long and that you may, it may be well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. And, and, uh, and there are two great promises with this. To honor your mother and father. It says it will go well with you and you will live a long life. I think that's amazing. I like that. I want it to go well with me and I want to have a long life. Maybe not until a hundred, but a long life at least. And so parents are there to be, to be to being God's co-workers on the earth to instill and to teach the children to, to, uh, to respect and honor leadership. And, so, and that goes for my whole life. My father is dead since six and a half years, but my mother is still alive. But man, on, on the funeral when my father died, I, I was holding the speech and I, I just tried to honor him as much as I could. Did he have any mistakes? A lot of mistakes, a lot of faults. You can ask my six siblings. Yes, they did. But there were so many good things. And to honor him, I do it with all of my heart. And I try to honor mom as much as I can because I love her, of course, but also I want it to go well with me and I want to live a long life. And you can do the same also. You can look beyond the mistakes of your parents. They are there. God has given you your mother and your father. So honor them in Jesus' name. Uh, in Genesis chapter 9, it's the story of Noah. It's been raining. It, there's a flood. And he has been, Noah and his family has been there in the ark for about more than a half a year. Uh, and once they come out of the ark, uh, it, it's, they grow a vineyard and they produce vine wine and uh, and so Noah is drinking wine and he becomes drunk and he is in his tent and he's drunk and one of his sons comes in there and he sees his father drunk and he runs out and he says hey hey Ham and uh, uh, Ham and Japheth do you know what uh, dad has been drinking and he's drunk in the he's in the tent go see it why don't you go see it it's funny you know ha 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 you know let's you know let's demean him a little bit and, but the two brothers, they say, hey, that's not how we treat our father. He has actually rescued uh, and brought rescue to this world. We do not expose him where he is. Instead, they take a piece of clothing and they go backwards into the tent and they cover over the nakedness of their father. 
uh, and when he wakes up and knows and understands what has taken place, he actually speaks a, a, a word of of cursing over the son who exposed him his nakedness, but he speaks a word of blessing over those that covered him uh, after that. And when I thought about that story, I drew a, a parallel to where we are today, actually, in the pandemic, because we are in a lockdown situation. Noah was in a lockdown. He was actually locked into God, closed the door on the ark and said, hey, you're in there now until you get stuck on the Mount Ararat. Uh, and, and until I open the door again. And so, um, and so this lockdown, it actually, it brought me parallels back to the, uh, to the golden 20s or the roaring 20s or the happy 20s that was there from, 19, uh, um, from 1920 until 1929. And what preceded that was the First World War and then the Spanish flu. Uh, where about 50 to 100 million people died, uh, especially in Europe. Very, very bad, situ very difficult situation. And after that, people just broke out in all different kinds of partying, of wild stuff, dancing, just, whoo, you know, we want to do what we've never done before. We're so tired of this hard life. And, and so that's why it's called the happy, the happy 20s. But a lot of new borders that had not been crossed before were crossed. And, and then came the, 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 the stock market crash in 1929, which led to the global depression. But I'm thinking, what if we are heading towards what might be called the golden 20s? What will happen when people just break out of, of their isolation, out of the, the lockdown that they've been in? How will we treat the Noahs that we will meet out there who maybe are, they do stuff they, they shouldn't do. They expose things they shouldn't do. They're, they're living. Are we going to show honor to those that are, that are due honor? Or should we just say, hey, let's expose it. He's done wrong. He fell. He did this and that. And I'm not saying should we not speak the truth. We should speak the truth, but in love. Uh, and, and cover up when it needs to be covered up and show honor. To show honor in Hebrew, the word kabad means to give weight or to be heavy. To give weight to something, to put weight on something. That means to give you, you're important to me. Psalms 8 says that God, when God created man, he crowned him with glory and with honor. And so when you meet people, do you pick the crown off their head? Do you try to just push them down? Or do you try to, hey, you lost your crown, get it back again. Live in your dignity. Live as, as, God, as God's creation. Put that crown back onto the head of people that you meet. Because many have lost their crown. The second thing here in 1 Peter 2 is to love the brotherhood to love the brotherhood. And there are promises in this. What happens when you love the brotherhood? Of course, that is the sisterhood. You know that. No, I don't need to mention that. First Peter, First John 2, it says, whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So when... You love your brother. You are staying in the light. That's a promise. When you love your brother, you're in the light. Hey, I want to be in the light. We have an awful lot of darkness here in the north in the wintertime. And it's so beautiful when the snow comes, when the light returns. If you want to stay in God's light, you have to love your brother. It's difficult. Yes, I know it's difficult. If you hate your brother, it says you are in darkness and you don't know where you're going. I know, I want to know where I'm going. I want to know where I'm going. How can I know where I'm going? I'm going to love my brothers. And that is spelled out in different ways, depending on who you meet, when you meet. 1 John 4, 12. If we love one another, God abides in us. How can God's presence, God abide in you? You follow him, you love him. How can God abide in you? By loving your brothers. We need to learn 
to love each other. It's, it's hard. It's really hard. 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. Where does love originate? Does it need to start with me? No, it doesn't originate with me. It originates in God because he loved me first. So if I cannot love you from me to you, because you are hard to love, you're a hard case. You're a difficult person. I need to go to God. God, do you love this person? And he says, yes, I love this person. I died for this person. I love him. I love her. And then, and I can know and, and love this person because God loves that person. I can love through God. God loves everyone around you. That's an amazing, an amazing uh, truth that is so profound, I think. Um, we started years ago here in our church to start to pray for the other churches in our city. Uh, that it would be well with them, that they would prosper, that they would grow, that revival would come, that they would be blessed. And that was a little bit hard, I would say, in the, in the beginning when we prayed it regularly on our Sunday services. But it's been so healthy for us to pray for the success of others. Because we are generous, basically, we are very... Uh, uh, we are, we are very um, selfish in, in our nature. And to break that off and to just bless other organizations, to bless other churches. And at one pi point after we had been praying that for years, I just started to think and I counted four churches in our city that, were, that there was renovation going on. They were rebuilding the, and repairing the, the, the church auditorium, the church sanctuary. And I was saying, yes! Praise the Lord, they're going, they're doing well. They're, they're, they're preparing for harvest. Praise the Lord, God is answering our prayer. It's going well with them. And, and, and that's good when you can really rejoice with the brothers. And since then, we have also renovated our church and it's still going on. So uh, what you sow, you will also harvest. Um, so... Uh, and to love the brothers is, is also to come close to them, to meet them. And, uh, and one thing that stuck out to me was when we lived in Siberia years ago, uh, a, a, an old man who was an archimandrit, an archimandrit and he, which is an honorary title in the Russian Orthodox Church. And, uh, and he came to visit us in Siberia and he brought a, a, a greeting and a blessing to us. And he had a, a, a gray beard like down to here and he had big black clothes and, you know, his hat on and everything. And he had his comb stuck under his beard. I had never seen that in my life. And he took out, you know, took out the comb in the middle of the service and he started to comb his, his beard down like that. That was a new thing for me. Uh, and then he brought a beautiful blessing and he said, I, I, I love you and I'm so happy for you. If you ever start a church like this in Moscow, I'm going to be the first one to join. Well, he has... He, I don't know if he joined because he died several years later. But this man, uh, he had suffered for his faith. He had, sit, he had been sitting in the work, the labor camps of Stalin in Gulag. And he had, and he had, uh, been, he had frozen his, uh, uh, he, had, uh, he, had, uh, he had damaged his leg because of the freezing cold. And he had an amputation. So he was, he was limping, you know, all of his life. He had lead life. He was really suffering for the sake of Christ. And to learn to know this is a brother in Christ. He loves Jesus. He has suffered for the same faith of Jesus Christ. It was such a blessing to, to learn to know this man. Um, so, uh, so there are brothers and sisters everywhere. Um, <clears throat> the third thing that Peter says in 1 Peter 2, is to fear God. To fear God. What does it mean to fear God? It means to revere God. It means to honor Him, to, uh, to have a high and deep respect, a great esteem, a reverence, an awe of God's power and authority, to set Him on high, to worship Him. Well, the opposite then would be to despise, to scoff, to deride, to belittle him, to make God smaller than what he is. Well, he, that doesn't, that, that doesn't do any good. We need to exalt him uh, and, 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 and make him great. 
Uh, so we are called and asked to fear God, to honor and to fear him. And, and Job says that it is wisdom to fear the Lord, to respect him, to honor. You're wise if you do it. Uh, and we don't always see it. Uh, well, there, there's, we need more people <laughs> to do that out in society. Uh, but the promises uh, that are uh, that the blessings that are connected to this are quite are, are quite uh, uh, strong actually. I found that I find some of them. There's many of them, but I find some of them in Psalms 103 verse 11. For as the heavens are uh, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love towards those who fear Him. So to fear uh, the Lord, it releases God's mercy or His steadfast love. It releases God's mercy and his steadfast love. Verse 13, as a father shows compassion, compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. So to fear the Lord, it releases God's compassion. We need God's compassion. So to fear him brings God's compassion. Verse 17, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. So to fear the Lord releases God's love and righteousness to the grandchildren. So, uh, uh, so if you want something to be passed on to your grandchildren, you say, I'm not even married, I'm not even planning for it, and you're, I, I'm not even thinking about kids, well, one day you might end up in having children and even grandchildren and you have to pass something on to them and you can pass something on to them but having the fear of God in your life. I fear God, I honor him, I respect him. I meet people that call themselves Christians and they probably are but their mouths are saying something else. There is cussing, there is cursing, there is bad language, coarse language. I do not understand that because the Bible says we should honor the Lord with our mouths. How can I honor the Lord with my mouth and say, I love you, Jesus, hallelujah, and at the same time use my mouth for bad language? I think that is something that we should abstain from. How do I fear God? How do I try to live this out in my life? Because... As long as things are a theory, as long as you just heard it and it's not a part of your life, you haven't heard what I'm saying. Do you know that? That's the Jewish thought. You have only heard what I'm saying when you're doing what I'm saying. That's the way, the definition of hearing in Jewish. When you're doing what I'm saying, then you've really heard what I'm saying. How do I do it? This is how I do it. I fear the Lord. Sundays is a special day. Sunday must be and should be, I think, a day that is different from the other six working days. Six days we should work. Seventh day is the day of the Lord. How do we do that? Well, now it's corona. We know it's pandemic. Well, a simple little thing that we do in our family is that, well, we always tune in to the, to the church uh, and to follow the church service. But we also have a Sunday porcelain that we use every Sunday. We also use it, of course, when we have guests, but it's to differentiate between every day and Sunday and to say, ha, huh, it's Sunday today. We use this porcelain and we maybe have a nicer breakfast. We spend more time on that. It's a way to differentiate it. Um, uh, also, um, and I, I can also say I was brought up in that way. My mother was amazing. We were seven kids, always uh, a lot of stuff going on. But every Sunday we would eat all of our meals in the, in the dining room and, and she would have a tablecloth and nice stuff and she would bake uh, bread and she would have orange juice, which was not that common back then. Uh, and, and we would have it nice. And then we all had to go to church, to Sunday school and church. But all of our meals were eaten in that place. It was a day that was different. Uh, so whatever way that you can fear God, honor God, uh, uh, and, and revere Him, just, just think about it. How do I revere God? How do I show Him respect? Do, am I ashamed of Him when I'm out 
in society? Or do I, do I stand up for him? The fourth thing that, uh, that we have in, in, this, uh, in these words from Peter is to honor the emperor. To honor the emperor. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, when, when the Pharisees try to, to, uh, to, uh, to get to Jesus and to entangle him in his word, they are uh, bringing, um, they are bringing a, a coin to him, a dinar, and they say, tell us, what do you think? This is Matthew 22, verse 15. Um, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus understood uh, and was aware of their malice. And he say, why put men to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin on the tax. And they, uh, and they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness in his description is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said, thereof, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. So by saying this, uh, Jesus is actually saying and, and uh, val uh, validifying or giving value to the Roman supremacy. Uh, th they were not like, they were oppressors, but he still says, hey, who's the picture on this coin here? Well, it is Caesar. Well, you should do, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. So he's saying, He's recognizing the present rulership by encouraging to pay the tax. Now we're down into real life. Have you ever paid the tax? We have to do it in Sweden in May, what is it, 2nd? May 2nd every year, we have to pay our taxes uh, and there's no excuse for it. Uh, but I do come into contact with many people uh, outside in my street work that uh, will do whatever they can to avoid uh, to be in any kind of contact with authority to pay the taxes. Well, so, so Jesus says it's, that, that uh, it is central and important for the rule of law to operate in a country. Now, let me give you just a short, a short example that a couple of years ago, because our church a parish house became a refugee camp some years ago, we had at the most 280 people, refugees living out there. Uh, we have sold it as of today. And instead we built a sports arena here. And, and uh, so life moves on. But I still have contact with many of these people that lived out there. And one man was an Iraqi uh, uh, man who had a high position in Iraq and his wife. And he was studying Swedish and he was working and he was so proud of it that he was really, you know, moving along. And one day he, he fainted in his bathtub and uh, his wife found him and he was brought to the hospital and he had a, he had a stroke, a massive stroke. And uh, so I was there to visit him in the hospital in the intensive care. And when I was there to, uh, to talk to them and pray for them, and his wife was, uh, you know, she, she, was, uh, she was, you know, it was a very hard situation. And uh, his relative was there. And I had just heard... Uh, uh, then what it costed, the price of having a day and night at that intensive care unit. Well, uh, it was well over uh, um, 100,000 Swedish kroners, uh, which would be like 10,000 euros, something like that. But I checked yesterday, how much is the price to, be, to stay one day and night in that, in that care? And the, the intensive care nurse that I talk, talked to yesterday, she said, well, the basic price for that is, is 7,500 euros to stay there. So I told his relative, I said, hey, do you know that because we have paid taxes, we can rescue the life of your relative because we do that. And he is worth it. We want to rescue him and we're happy that we can do it. But don't ever forget to pay your taxes. Because by doing that, you can rescue life. And it just, it dawned on him. And that's how we need to see it. Because if we're going to have a functioning society, we need to be paying tax. It's something very Christian. Jesus said it. Jesus said it. Peter said it. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible, friends. It is written in the Bible. Now, you can be smart. You can do things. 
but you cannot wiggle and squirm and move around and, and fly off to somewhere else to get away from it. That is not a Christian lifestyle. Romans 13 says, For the authority is God's servant for your good. The authority is God's servant. Romans 13, 7, Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is, revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Now, we should never stop speaking to authority. We are the salt and the light. So I'm not saying just, you know, lay down and become nothing. That's not what I'm saying. We have a job to do. But at the same time, as speaking the truth, we should also honor them by giving the due taxes to them. So, in concluding this message today, which might have hurt you, it might have helped you, it might have made you upset, that's wonderful. Be happy or be upset and I will be your best friend. It's okay. Receive what you can receive from this word, but our new lives in Christ should be lived out in such a way, what I think, by respecting other people, by loving our family in the faith, by fearing God and by honoring the authorities. And just as my final word here is Saul in the Old Testament, he had fallen, he had, he had been rebellious towards God. He had lost the crown on his life, the crown. He was the king, but he had lost it. He was still had the position, but he was doing bad. He tried to murder and to kill David. David was anointed to be the next king. But David and David could have just stabbed him and said, you're out of business. You have failed. You're a nothing. You're a zero. Get out of here. But he and he had the chance. He was so close to him. But he said, no. I will not touch God's anointed one. And Saul says, because my life was precious in your eyes this day, you have kept me, you have rescued me. And, and, uh, and, and this is so beautiful, I think, how we can even say that to people that, 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 that are not doing what they should be doing, but their life can still be precious in our sight. Can you put value on people's life? Can you give them value? Can you honor them? I know it's hard, but it's, there's always something that you can honor about someone. Everywhere you are, there's something you can honor about them. If people are mean on the telephone, if they hang up on me, I say, well, thank you for at least answering. Thank you for saying hi. That was very kind of you. And, and try to flip it around and to bring honor. And you will see it. Queen Esther, she got access to the king when she honored him. God will open up doors for you when you honor, when you start to bring honor to the authorities of the city where you live. I've, I've seen it in my own life, how doors are opening up when you bring honor, when you pray for them of your, from your heart, of a true heart. God will open up doors to you when you honor people around you, when you love the brotherhood. And do pay your taxes. Do what you should do. God will see and give you a way in it. So maybe you need to correct some things. Maybe you need to stop doing things. Maybe you need to start doing things. But let the Holy Spirit lead you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that your word is living, alive. And you say it is like a sword, a two-edged sword. And it cuts through. Father, I thank you that your word cuts through and it separates, Father, the things that needs to be separated in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you help us to live out our life in you, in Christ Jesus, right where we are, on our streets, Lord, with our neighbors, Lord in our working places. Lord, when it comes to how we relate to authorities, when it comes to the brotherhood, our brothers and sisters in the faith, Lord. Oh, Father, I thank you. 
I pray, Father, that you will help my brothers and sisters to see the way forward, to know what to do now, Lord. We're not, we might feel locked in and, and pushed back, Lord, but there is coming a day when we will need to cover up, help each other, Lord, like the sons of Noah did. I thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Let us have that spirit of the two sons, Lord, that didn't expose, but instead, Father, they protected and they helped all oh, this, this, this man of God, Father. We thank you. Lord, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord for showing us the way and what we need to correct and what we need to do uh, for, for, for now and the future days. Prepare us, Lord. Oh, when you open up the ark, the door of the ark, and it is time to move out. Thank you, Father. The world has changed, but we have also changed. Help us, Lord, to be ready for the world that we will meet now after the pandemic. I thank you, Father. Thank you for the time of the greatest harvest. Oh, that is coming, Lord. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. Oh, for what you have prepared for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It is not wasted time in the ark, in the close down. No, it is time of preparation. Thank you, Father. We bless your holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So be encouraged, my friend. You're not in an empty space. You're not in a vacuum. You are right where God wants you to be and He's preparing us for the days that are ahead. So God bless you and, uh, and have a wonderful Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen.